I'm not gonna make. I'm just gonna go right down to business. Um, uh, I'm really pleased to have this uh, opportunity to have this conversation with Charles. I've been very inspired by his book, and uh, I've been inspired by a lot of books, but it's very rare that you actually get the chance to ask follow-up questions to someone who's written a book that you're very inspired by. So I see that as a great privilege. My idea is to start out with some questions to give uh, Charles a chance to just explore some of his basic ideas. I'm sure a lot of people in here are already familiar with uh, Charles' work, uh, but even if you already read the book, I think it's sometimes nice to hear it from the horse's own mouth. I don't know if that goes in English. But <laughs> and then afterwards, I would like to uh, move a little further and explore some things that I came to think about as I was reading the book. And if we get through all of my questions, we will have covered the issues of money, God, and gender. And I think that's sort of... <laughs> so, um, I'm going to start with money. Um, as I understand your book, your, one of your main points of departure is this idea that the original form of economic exchange is not barter. It's not this exchange where I give you something and you give me an equivalent back, but rather it's giving, which is sort of the fundamental uh, form of economic interaction. And according to you, and I think you're right, um, this has fundamental implications for how to think about money today. So I'd like my first sort of question or comment, or I would, I would like to hear you explain um, this idea of giving as the foundation of economics. What does that mean? Yeah, yeah, thanks, Oli, for that question. Uh, <laughs> every anthropologist knows that barter was not the origin of money. It's only economists who think that money started in barter. And there's a good reason why they think that, uh, why they choose to believe that. Uh, because barter kind of, the idea of barter is maybe I have apples and you have oranges. And, and so I'll say, well, I'll give you five apples for eight oranges. And you say, no, no, I will only take I will only give you seven oranges. And I say, well, how about six? And we make some kind of deal where we're both trying to get the best deal. And that's the same uh, psychology that we use when we use money. And you go to the store, and this one costs 10 euros, and this one costs 8 euros. So of course, you try to get the best deal. And what it, it says something about, about human nature. Uh, it says that human beings naturally want to maximize their own self-interest. That is one of the fundamental principles of, of, of economics. Uh, but that's not <laughs> how most, in fact, how all societies worked for money. They were gift societies. Uh, so, I, so in those societies, it wasn't like I'm trying to get the best deal in our interaction, but uh, in those societies, generosity was encouraged by the way that, that social relations existed. So, so um, the more that I gave, then the more people would want to take care of me, too. So altruism and selfishness uh, were not distinct in the way that they are today. And economic life reflected what we might call spiritual teachings that say, you know, as ye give, so ye shall receive. That was actually true in, in a gift culture. And, and so part of the transition that we're making today is to reawaken that, that part of human nature. I'm not saying that that's all of human nature, but there's a part of us that, that, that want to give, and, and we're alive in order to give, and, and we even maybe understand that the purpose of life is to give. Uh, I don't want to go on too long, um, but I'd like to talk about more about that later. What, because today our, our money system suppresses that in many ways. The thing that really moves our hearts, uh, the thing that we really want to contribute to on this planet, ecological healing, social justice, and so forth, those gifts that we want to give, there's not a lot of money in those things. And the money is in the things that are driving us over the cliff. And why should that be? When, 
What is money that, that suppresses our desire to give and encourages our very narrowly conceived rational self-interest? Can you, can you uh, on, on your, um, uh, your book, on the cover, there's this uh, beautiful old painting, which is obviously connects to the theme of abundance. And I, I, that's also a central theme in your book, is to say that today we live in, even though we have all these, that there's so many, I think there's more things in the world that, well, that's probably not true, but there's more products in the world than there ever has been. And nevertheless, we have this feeling, there's not enough, there's this scarcity. And your point is also that, well, that's an illusion, this illusion of scarcity, and it acts, it is act, it's actually sort of fabricated by this system of money. Yeah. Can you expand on that or yeah. control that? I mean, sometimes, uh, sometimes people get upset when I say that we live in a world of fundamental abundance. And they say, well, that's easy for you to say in an affluent Western society, but don't you know that one in five people go to bed hungry every day? How can you say that there's not scarcity? I understand that at this moment, there are people starving. There are children in Haiti who are eating dirt because they're so hungry. But that's not because there's not enough food in the world. That's because of how the food is distributed. And how is the food distributed? How do we decide that? A lot of the answer to why food is distributed in the way that it is is because of how the money system works. There's a shortage of money, not a shortage of food. And money is something that is not limited by anything except our agreements. So that's why I say that the scarcity that we face is artificial. Same thing can be said about fossil fuels. How much of our fossil fuel consumption really goes to anything that serves human well-being? <laughs> Not very much. So that's another example of artificial scarcity. And uh, then there are the kinds of things that, that you cannot measure. This will be one of the themes I might talk about later when I talk about beyond the lean economy. Um, uh, economy, as even the most broad-minded economist conceives it, uh, if it's a science, it's a study of the things that can be measured. Today, in our society, we have more than ever of the things you can measure. Um, more square meters per person, more stuff per person. But the things that we cannot measure are very scarce. Hugs, for example. Intimacy. Uh, looking around and knowing the stories behind the faces. Everything we call community. Connection to nature. Mm -hmm. One of the things I found inspiring in your book is the way that you construe your argument so it doesn't become this question of for or against the economy. And your argument is not to say so the economy is bad as such. Rather, what you're doing is that you expand the concept of economy to encompass other spheres of life that we do not normally think about in those terms. And um, I find that uh, extremely productive and, and it also allows you then to say so so the, the so the so the task now is to change the parameters of the economy to be in line with, with the nature. I mean both sort of the external nature but also the human nature. Um, on that note I, I, I just want to note that I'm really pleased that we're having this event at CBS because on the, on the one hand this is an unlikely event at CBS and on the other hand I think to have this kind of conversation. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, and I find this, this, expanding this idea of economy, I find that, first of all, I find it, or not first, but I find it theoretically interesting, but I also find it strategically or politically interesting, because I think one of the problems in politics is to, today is that everything is reduced to a question of economy. And I think your concept of economy allows us to go along with that, to sort of 
enter the polit this political discourse and say, okay, so you want to talk about economy? Let's talk about economy. And then we can sort of bring in these economic ideas to sort of go along with this. Um, and along those lines, I also like the idea that um, it seems to me that what, we have, what we've been trying to do for the past 40, 40 years or something is to try and change people. Say, oh, consume less, fly less, recycle. And it hasn't worked. And I think what you're saying uh, is that, no, let's start changing money. Uh, and I think it's, it's, it's much easier to change money than it is to change people. Um, so I, want to, I would like to pick up one of these. There's plenty of ideas in your books of how to do this. And, uh, but one of the ideas that fascinated me the most is this old idea from, what's his name, Silvio uh, yes, himself, yeah? This idea of negative interest. Can you tell us a little bit more about this idea of negative interest? Yeah. Uh, that requires uh, building some context. Uh, can I do, maybe just respond to one or two other things? Oh, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. Um, and maybe I'll get to negative interest. Uh, I don't know. But, um, yeah. Um, the whole thing about, about you know, uh, changing people versus changing money um, and, and being here at uh, Copenhagen uh, Business School, where if, if we look, if we see the problem with the world as people, as especially some bad people, for example, the greedy CEOs and bankers and business people and the people who go to business school, <laughs> then, then we're going to be blind to the real root of the problem. You might find when you actually meet one of these evil people in person, they're not actually any more evil than anybody else. The, the, the strategy of conquering evil and that way of seeing the world is thousands of years old. And it's a form of, of uh, othering, of, of making an other, a separate person, out of another person, which is contrary to the understanding of uh, interconnection or interbeing that we're moving into. And, and um, so let me say that I'm, I'm really happy that we're here at the business school as well. Uh, and, and that the, the consciousness that we are moving into is affecting everybody, including people in business, who are maybe connecting to the original purpose of business, which isn't as is taught to extract the maximum possible. But business ultimately should be a way of, of giving something to the world. And, and even uh, in the most um, manipulative corporate slogans or corporate vision statement, there's always something about that too. It's like a recessive gene inside the corporate DNA. <laughs> You know, even if the corporate vision statement is, we're going to, we aim to maximize shareholder value and, and maximize profits or something like that, there's always something else in there. And you can look at that as cynical public relations uh, and see those people as, you know, cynical, evil liars. Um, <laughs> but could it be that, that it's the situation that they're in that makes them into who they are? And have you ever had the experience when you're put into some kind of institution, some kind of hierarchy, and you begin playing out the roles that are implicit in, in that place? So, so part of this the situation that we're in, all of us, is a situation that we call money. We're immersed in a money world. And that affects the way that we see other people, the way that we see life. Um, and so that's why we're talking about changing money, uh, and then seeing how is human nature going to change in response to that. Now I think that also there is, there is a change happening in our, in our consciousness and perceptions. Um, so it's not a one-way dynamic. Um, it's, um, you know, each, who we are affects the systems built on top of that money, and the systems affect who we are. So it goes both ways. So negative interest um, I guess, without saying a whole lot about it, um, in a gift culture, possessions were a burden. 
If you had more than you needed, you would happily share. Because either you were nomadic and you'd have to carry around possessions, or uh, maybe you were a, a primitive farmer, primitive in quotes, uh, and, and if you had too much grain or too many bananas, they would go bad. And it was much better to give them away. And then when you were in need, somebody would give back to you. Money is not like that. Money does not decay over time. Um, we could talk about inflation and stuff, but if you have enough money, you can um, invest it in risk-free securities and grow your money. So you can grow more by having more. And so I think, well, what would happen if we made money like everything else in the universe that decays and that you can't maintain and hold wealth just by having, but instead you have to, to share, you have to, to give. Um, so that's a very tiny piece of the theory. Yeah. Uh, I think obviously your book provides both a sensible and a very beautiful vision of what we should do. Um, however, there's one question that I'm struggling with in my own work, and that's not so much this question of what to do, but it's more why have we not already done it? I think that for me that's, that's kind of a mystery. What, I mean, we've known about many of these pro environmental, or we've known about it for 40 years that it's it was going downhill, and yet we haven't done anything. And I think in order for us to actually make a transition, I think we need to sort of break that or solve that riddle. So I'd like to hear you on what, why have we already, what has yeah. been standing in the way of this transition? Yeah, well, the old, the old systems have a lot of momentum. Um, you could ask the same question about an alcoholic. The alcoholic knows that the, that the drink is destroying his life, destroying his health, destroying his relationships. He knows that. And you can tell him that this is happening, and he'll say, yeah, you're right, but he's still helpless to stop drinking until, until, as they say, he hits bottom, until his world falls apart, until there's some kind of collapse. Uh, right now, and until that happens, there's a part of him that can still pretend that this is sustainable. Yeah, you know, I can keep drinking, I can mortgage my house, you know, I can sell my, my television, I can, right, I can still keep it going. And I think our, our, our society is very much in that place um, where, where it's still possible to pretend. The politicians are still pretending that the days of high growth will come back. So we're still pretending that, that, that the debts can be paid off, you know, if only we grow our way out of the crisis. And it's not yet become undeniably obvious to most people that the system is doomed. I think, it, I think that we're going to have to go through uh, a lot um, more of, of, of a breakdown before, before we wake up. Mm -hmm. Along those lines, I, there's another, I wouldn't call it a paradox, but there's something in your argument. It's like you, you're in your book, there's a, there's a kind of theory of evolution in your book. There's a sketch, this evolution of uh, humanity. And then you combine that with a very fundamental humanism. And you have, one, you have one formulation where you say, a fundamental premise of this book is that the human beings naturally desire to give. We are born into gratitude. And um, I am... Um, but to... Maintain that uh, fundamental humanism, which I, I was going to say, which I buy into. I'm not sure that's the right formulation. <laughs> uh, however, we need to explain. We need to say, well, if this is the case that humans actually are this kind of beings, then at some point in time, evolution must have been gotten sidetracked somehow to end where we are now. So can you say, well, when does this happen? When yeah. do we sort of go off the rails and, and, and oh, how right. does this come this is, a, this is another big topic. Um, the uh, next question is God, so... Uh, all right. <laughs> 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 I mean, this, this gets into uh, some very uh, metaphysical uh, or speculative territory that might make hard-headed economics 
geeks in the audience feel uncomfortable, but I see um, uh, that humanity has gone on this journey of separation, uh, starting from an original unity of some kind, uh, and this is, goes back hundreds of thousands or even millions of years, uh, where we became more and more separate from nature, first with artificial tools, stone, then with fire, creating a self-other uh, domestic wild distinction, then a symbolic culture, language, that, that, that creates, um, that begins to make the world ours, we begin to impose categories on it. Then uh, agriculture, domestication, uh, turning other beings to human purposes, uh, making plants and animals serve human ends, and then uh, industry, uh, uh, constructing an unnatural realm in which it appeared that we didn't even need nature. Uh, and then the final uh, phase is uh, the information revolution, where we live in a world that's not only unnatural, it's not even material, living more and more in a virtual world. And, and each one of these innovations happened at about uh, a tenth the time of the previous one. Uh, so there's this kind of uh, acceleration reaching an extreme of separation uh, and we can see it all around us, the extreme of separation. You know, uh, whole neighborhoods where not a single person knows their neighbors. Uh, people sitting in air-conditioned rooms at CIA headquarters pressing a button and raining down death. Um, and to them, it's just blips on a screen. Like these, these, uh, the extreme of separation where we're, we're even uh, capable of destroying the basis of life on Earth. Uh, all for the sake of some numbers. So it's reached this extreme, and as it reaches its extreme, it begins to give birth to its opposite. And we come back into a, a unity, uh, an, inter, an, uh, an experience of interconnectionness, of, inter, uh, of interdependency, interconnection, um, that it's not a return to the past, but it's kind of a bringing uh, the past into, into the present um, at a higher level of organization. Um, so, you know, gift economy, as we traditionally conceive it, works really well on a small social scale of less than, say, 500 people, where the contributions of each person happen to a social witnessing. Everybody sees who's giving and who's not. But um, in a mass society with uh, a global division of labor, uh, there has to be some other way to make gifts visible. Money is one way to do that. Money is kind of a substitute for the social witnessing that happens in the gift culture. Uh, which is why some people think I must be opposed to money. I do think money has its place, although it has exceeded its proper bounds and usurped the natural role of other kinds of relationship. Um, anyway, that's kind of a big picture thing. Mm -hmm. um, now, I, I want to make sure that we, I'm, I'm aware of the schedule, and I want to make sure that Whenever I'm at a conference, the best parts are always the parts in between the speakers. Now, I just want to put it out there. I want to make sure that we have time for that and that we're flexible with the schedule so that so that you know people have time for that kind of thing too. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm happy to keep talking to you too. <laughs> <laughs> I so you write in your I think that's actually your first sentence. Yeah, it is. You say, the purpose of this book is to make money and human economy as sacred as everything else in the universe. Um, my question is, can this be done without God? I, you seem to speak mostly about God in terms of something that we've lost. Say that, so God is no longer part of this. Or, or, um, so I'm kind of wondering, is God part of this new economy? Uh, okay. uh, <laughs> <laughs> so do we do that, and, and if we do, what kind of so, so here we, we live in, in a story, a story, a narrative, a mythology that says, that tells us the nature of the universe. And it says basically that it's composed of a bunch of generic, kind of standard um, building blocks that that are very simple, and, and, and they add up together kind of randomly to create the, the world that we perceive. Uh, and that outside of ourselves, there's no inherent intelligence or purpose in the universe. That's what science has essentially told us for a long time. Maybe not quite so much anymore. Well, 
the human heart protests against that because we, we experience um, a world that's alive and, and, and a world where there's, there's meaning and purpose. And, and, and sometimes we have experiences where we're in touch with what we might call the sacred. So religion then came in and said, essentially, they ended up agreeing with science. They said, yeah, science, you're right. Matter is just a bunch of generic dead building blocks. But there's this other thing outside of matter, and that's the source of sacredness, or spirit, or something like that. And so this, this seeming opposition between science and religion is an illusion. They're actually agreeing on the most important thing, which is that matter, materiality, the world, that's not sacred. That is a poison. That ideology is a poison that's killing the planet. Mm. Because we're treating this planet as if it were not sacred. So what I'm talking about when I, when I use the word sacred is I'm, I'm talking about returning, returning to a perception of the world and everything in it as, as sacred, as unique, as special. Sacredness is a matter of seeing the uniqueness of everything and the totality of the connections of everything. Uh, so and an indigenous person, person might have said, yeah, every drop of water is a unique individual. They're not uniform. Maybe if they had known about electrons, they would say every electron is a unique individual. <laughs> Quantum mechanics kind of validates that. You send one electron through an aperture, and it goes this way, and you send an identical one, subject to identical forces, through the aperture, and it goes that way. And, and this has boggled the minds of physicists for a long time. They can describe it mathematically, but they, 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 they can only explain it by saying, well, it's random. It's a causal. An indigenous person would say, well, obviously, this electron chose to go that way, and that one chose to go that way. They're unique, they're unique individuals. Um, but when we start seeing the world is composed of unique individuals that have the capacity for choice, and that has sentience. Uh, every tree, every animal, every rock, every ecosystem, the planet, then we can no longer uh, behave as if we were the lords and masters of nature, uh, uh, endlessly engineering this dead material substrate uh, uh, toward our own design um, without respecting that perhaps there's an inherent um, evolutionary purpose uh, in matter. Uh, and, and so part of what I'm looking at then is, is how, what does technology become when it's no longer a matter of imposing our will upon nature and conquering nature, but it's instead maybe um, understanding what wants to happen and participating in the ongoing development of nature. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what I understand, what I understand it's, it seems like you're saying, so yes, we should learn from some religions, and what you're talking about sounds like a kind of spiritual, maybe Buddhism or something. Maybe, I mean, even when you say spiritual, though, it's like you're talking about spirit meaning something separate from yeah, that. You well, know? Uh, yeah. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> my, are there, would there be other religions that we could sort of look to and might, I kind of thinking that for me, the most anti-capitalist religion at the moment is Islam. I mean, uh, they have these rules against interest and they also seem to be the, <laughs> I don't know if you can go by that, but they seem to be the religion that is most hated by those that are in power in the sort of the capitalist system. Uh, so, like, I mean, is there something we can pick up from that? Yeah. So they yeah. I, I, I mean, I think that. Um, I mean, it's not just Islam that that prohibits interest. Um, Christianity used to, um, and and even Judaism prohibited um, among other Jews. In other words, among 
people of their own tribe and said you should not charge interest to them. And now, as we realize that we're all one tribe on Earth, uh, that would be <laughs> Every religion has an esoteric core that validates um, everything I've been saying. Mm -hmm. uh, Buddhism, Taoism, uh, Islam, uh, you know, like this, the esoteric Sufi core of Islam, um, uh, uh, even Christianity. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's a, a non dual understanding uh, in every religion that we can learn from. Yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. Okay. <laughs> uh, so now I'm going to move on to another theme which I found sort of, I, I won't say, I, I'm not, but strangely absent from your book, but you, you don't talk much about it, uh, which is the theme of gender. Because uh, you're, you're talking about we need to change, we, we need to change money, we need to change our relation to nature, we need to change our relation to each other, to our body, and, and so forth. Uh, and yet, you, you you don't seem to talk so much about gender. At one stage, you talk about, I mean, you have this um, analysis where you say, well, what we what we call growth today is mostly just a matter of activities that used to be outside of the money economy, which have then now been absorbed into this uh, money economy, which is then registered as um, as. Uh, Growth and right. one of the examples you give is daycare, and in Denmark we have the, the world's highest frequency of employment among women, and we see that as a sign of pro this is something we're usually sort of proud of, and, uh, and when we go to war was I, I, I'm not going to go into that. And we see that as a sign of progress uh, that women are now more or less free not to take care of their children, so or right. caretaking is moved from the gift economy to the money economy. So my question would be, how do you see gender and, and gender roles in this new economy? Yeah, um, yeah. I, I didn't write a whole lot about that in the book, but I do have a lot of thoughts about it. Um, um, so just to take that example, um, so you, yeah, so you can say, well, progress for women means that they get to leave the home too, just like men and um, earn money in this uh, non-gift realm. But on another level, you can say that, that, that valuing that devalues uh, roles that were once um, considered the, the female role. It devalues, it says, you know, if you do stay home, yeah, yeah like that, like take it, basically it says that, that working for a salary uh, is more valuable than taking care of family, mm -hmm. cooking for children, like doing all of those things. So in a way, that, that movement toward what is called um, equality is actually like the, the ultimate devaluation of the feminine. Yes. And, and <laughs> That, that goes along with the devaluing of matter uh, in favor of spirit, the devaluing of the tangible, the material, and the messy, and the fleshly, and the human, uh, in favor of the mental, or the spiritual, or the, the, the higher things, you know? Like, why is higher better than lower? Why is superior mean better than, and inferior mean worse than? Why, why do we strive for high vibrations, you know? Is, is, is a flute better than a bassoon? You know, is a cloud better than a rock? You know, like, so this is, this is um, I think this has a lot to do with re-empowering the divine feminine. Mm -hmm. Practically speaking, one thing that this means is that we should have a universal basic income. Yes! So that, yes. Which, which, says, which says, we as a society value the things that cannot be measured. Ultimately, money is a form of measure. And we want to value the, the unmeasurable, too. We want to value the contributions that, that are invisible to the money economy. For example, the contribution of, of raising a family, being there for a child, and having time to really look at a child and be patient. Uh, and and like that kind of stuff is what's missing today. That's the kind of, and, and the absence of those unmeasurable things is what gives us the experience 
of poverty and anxiety and scarcity. No matter how much money you have, no amount of money can purchase the intangible. Um, so yeah, so these ideas, like they're not just metaphysical, you know, they, 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 are, they translate into really solid economic policies. So yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. We're at a university now, and I myself am in the business of uh, knowledge production. And uh, one of the things that struck me about your book is that it was at the same time mm, extremely philosophical, or extremely philosophically well-founded, while at the same time it was written, it is written in a form that is very unlike a lot of the other books that I uh, read. Um, and I think one of the things that I've been speculating about in my own work is that it seems to me that um, our system of knowledge production to a lot, although, I mean, I will say there's a lot of good intention. I mean, we have this conference and, and, but at the same time, there's also some, it seems like the system of knowledge production is also geared towards certain rationale. I think this growth literature is also geared in this. So I can't help thinking that if we, and when I say we, I mean we in the business of knowledge production, if we are to make a contribution to solving these issues, we also need to think about our own practice and the form of our own writings and stuff. So I'd like to hear your reflections on the relationship between the, the, the content of your book, or the, the form of your book, and the form of your writing, and the content and the message of yeah, um, yeah. Like it's not really an academic book, um, you know. As far as it doesn't um, abide by the uh, academic rituals of, of citing, you know, the right authorities. And uh, I mean, I do have some references and some citations, but it's not like it doesn't abide by the formula. Uh, and I think that that makes it more accessible uh, to some people. Um, and maybe less accessible to others, you know? Um, but I think there might be enough in there, even for academics, to say, yeah, this guy's done some reading, you know, this guy's aware of, of these basic issues. He's not trying to reinvent the wheel. Um, there's more to be said about, about knowledge production. Well, one of the things that strikes me is, when I'm trying to sort of deal with these issues, is that, on the one hand, I'm getting paid to produce new knowledge. And at the same time, I feel what we need now is not new knowledge. Yeah. It, the knowledge is already there. The right. ideas are already there. So it's just a matter of sort of picking the ideas and then repeating them. But that doesn't count as research, because that's no not yeah. new knowledge. Yeah. <laughs> that we learn in school that says that success consists in producing the right answer. In school, you produce the right answer, you give it to your teacher, and you get an A. Uh, but here, uh, left-leaning academia has been producing the right answer for, for centuries, you know. Um, like, you can read Noam Chomsky or read, like, all of these fairly accurate accounts of what's wrong in the world, uh, and like, there's vast bodies of writing about what to do with it, too, that, that I mean, maybe, you know, I offer some solutions in this book, and, and I, most of them aren't original, you know, I'm pulling them from other places, and there's other solutions out there in every realm, you know, how should we, how should we run an energy system, you know, how should we run an industrial system, how should we run a money system, how should we do all of these things, the answer's already out there, but perhaps changing the world does not, contrary to what we've learned in school, consists in producing the right answer. Maybe it's more important to be able to tell a good story. So, you know, we have this, I'm, I'm glad that the final event here is no longer called a debate. The debate is basically a contest to see who has the rightest answer. Yeah. And, and you try to overcome the other person's position with a kind of force. There's a kind of force inherent in the way that we debate, citing evidence and, and building logic, you know, and, and then trying to overcome other person's evidence and logic. Uh, and you find, if you've ever had a debate with your, I don't know, your brother-in-law who just doesn't get it. <laughs> <laughs> it, it does, like, you can't actually 
actually mean that way. <laughs> but what, how, so how, how do we create change in that? Um, one way is to disrupt the stories that people are living in. One way to do that is to give them experiences that don't fit into those stories. Um, Occupy disrupted the story of normal. Uh, the story that there's no other way to do things, maybe. The story that everything's fine around here. So that was, that's, I think that's why it was so powerful. It's a, it's a disruptor of the story. Um, telling stories can be disrupting of the story in a way that doesn't make people as defensive. Mm -hmm. And then also offering a new story, a new you know, narrative uh, that people can step into when the old story falls apart. That's another way to, to create change. Yes, I think we should stop now to allow time for the break. And yeah. Thank you. For yeah.